How you doing, man? I'm easy, man. I'm cool. Yeah? Yeah, man. When did you get in? Yesterday. Yeah? Yeah, man. You've been busy recently? Proper. Proper. Yeah? Seriously, yeah. So, for those in the room that haven't heard your name before, haven't heard your music before, can you just uh, introduce yourself, please? All right. Um, I go by the name of Sway. I'm an MC in the UK right now. I'm out of London. I'm an MC. Um, type of music I do is sometimes described as grime, sometimes described as hip hop. It's kind of like bang in the middle. It's like a, a UK hip hop kind of thing. And the reason why, like, I'm, I've got a bit of a reputation in the UK, quite known in the UK right now, like, as far as the underground, probably the biggest rapper, like, on the underground, crossing over. Reason being is because I've done everything independently and I came out differently. Like, a lot of you lot probably don't know too much about London. I'm not sure how much you lot know about London, but it's not like the stereotypes. You know, a lot of people stereotype Britain as being, you know, castles, you know, with the queens everywhere you go, you know, number 10 down the street. Britain is, like, very much like New York. When I went to New York, I thought, I felt at home at New York because London, not Britain, London is very yeah. much like New York. You know, half of the rappers that have come over from America to perform in, in London have gone back to America without their jewellery. And... You know, like, it's not a joke out in London right now. Mm. You know, a lot of guys are coming over, you know, acting like Britain is going to be tea and crumpets and they get robbed. It's not a joke out there, you know. So I'm representing a side of London that a lot of people might not see or m might not come up on the news or in the films. You know what I mean? So, yeah, that's me. And, well, it's more independent. I started my own label called Decipher Productions. And all we were doing was selling mixtapes. You know, we were selling them out the car, driving to stores ourselves, selling them um, over the internet, right after shows, I'd sell them. And before we knew it, we were the highest mixtape, well, I was the highest mixtape seller in the UK, full stop. And a lot of companies started to take notice, all magazines started writing about me, and also won like five awards this year alone off the back of the mixtapes. So. Mm. That's probably why, like, my name started propelling quite fast. Mm. You're, you know, you're definitely a good person to talk to about the DIY ethic of doing music because, um, well, Sway won a Mobile Award in the UK this year, um, which is quite an amazing achievement. Um, for the, the MOBO is Music of Black Origin Awards that we have in the UK. And in your category there was who? Um, 50 was in the category. 50 Cent. Um, Roots and Nouveau. Roots. Game, um, who else? Kano. Kano. That's who I can remember. Mm. But it was like, it was voted for by the British people. Mm. You know? so. And that's the significance of, of why we want to talk to Sway today because here's someone that basically has won a very prestigious award, well, awards over the course of the year. He's got records being played on daytime radio across on national radio as well, you know, across the country. And like you say, he's the highest like CD mixtape seller in the country and he hasn't got a record deal, you know. Hasn't start, ever signed a record deal, hasn't, you know, hasn't ever used that machine, right? So, yeah. like, you know, I want to know about what it's like doing it yourself. It's hard because the labels, they tempt me every day, like, you know, like from two years ago when I first started getting played on radio, I've been getting calls from record labels, wanting meetings, but what I wanted to do is create a demand for myself. I knew I had the talent to do what I wanted to do, and I knew I had something different. Now, the thing about me that's different to a lot of other rappers in the UK is I'm very humorous. I've got a lot of humor in what I do. You know, I've got a slight comedy element to what the music I do in a place where right now people are just talking all crazy stuff. You know, like in a scene where everyone's talking about guns, whatever, drugs, whatever. I came out and I've done a bit different, I've done something a bit different. For example, my first track that I shot a video for that was really getting played was a song called Flow Fashion, which was actually about credit cards and how people get into debt with credit cards. Now, I was playing this character who ordered a credit card and um, was going everywhere, swiping, buying this, buying that, buying this for her, him, dad, mum, whatever. And at the end of the day, I don't know what you lot call them, but, you know, the bailiffs, people that, if you don't pay your bill, 
they come and start taking up your TV and everything. You know, at the end of the track, that's what happens to me as the character. I don't pay the bill and I end up in debt. And I'm pretty sure that everybody out here knows somebody or is in debt themselves. Some kind of debt to a bank, whether it's not paying a bill, everybody's in debt. So it was a track that everybody around the board could relate to. And it, you know, it transcended into a different market for me. So, have you got that with you? Yeah, I got it somewhere. How long ago did you make that? That track was made in 2002. Yeah, it was made in 2002, but it came out in 2004. Okay. Flow fashion. Oh. Yeah, that's it basically for you lot. One, I'm here. So you, got, you understand, like, but sometimes when like playing something like that to a crowd of people, I don't know where you are from, I'm not sure if you can understand every word I'm saying, you know, because in London I'm pretty clear, like I'm probably one of the most, one of the rappers with the most clarity I'd say, like in the UK, but sometimes you lot, like, especially Americans, they still don't get it, you know, they don't understand for some strange reason, I'm speaking English, but you know, your language is English, but for some reason, don't understand what I'm talking about half the time. Mm. You know? But, you, but I mean, you can under, when you, when you grew up listening to records yeah, from the Yeah, I can understand, Bronx you know, Brooklyn, I listen to some... understand that, right? I, lost, I listen to some of the most obscure hip-hop. I listen to some American artists that American people don't even listen to. You know, I, I go to New York and I say, yeah, um, I'm looking for the new Sugar Free album, and everyone's looking at me weird, like, who's this Sugar Free guy? Mm. You know, like... It's, it's weird, I listen to a lot of stuff and I understand it. We've grown to understand a lot of the American slang and a lot of the sayings and things like that. But somehow, for some strange reason, we haven't been able to get the same respect. Mm. Like when, when we, us, we're us doing our thing, you know, like, um, like Dizzy, Dizzy does quite well over here. Dizzy Rascal. Yeah, like he does quite well in America as far as UK artists mm. goes. But still, it's not as well as he should do. You know, mm. he's a very talented. Like, like I went on tour with Dizzy, like last year, the beginning of last year, and that's how I widened my fan base. Cause I was, I, I, I had a friend that had a friend that knew him, and then we contacted him and was like, look, man, just want to set up your show, just want to start warm, warm up your show. He's like, yeah, he knew I wasn't everything, and he was like, yeah, standard, we could deal with that. So I went on tour with him, and I was just effing up the tour everywhere I was going. I was selling like no less than like a hundred CDs a night, you know, right after just coming off the stage and signing them for people. That was the incentive for, for selling it, just sign it and everyone wanted one, you know, like I'd do a freestyle where people would, you know, tell me what to rap about. And there was another thing I was rapping about downloading, which was very current at the time, like, cause I had, I got a track, you don't understand what I'm saying, right? Yeah? Yeah. I got a track called download, yeah? And everywhere I do that, people respond to it well. Um, what should we get on to now? Well, we'll, t we'll talk about the, you know being a UK artist yeah. and, and a bit later. But first of all, just tell us like how many, you know, I mean, you still haven't put an actual album out of yeah. original material. I mean, uh -huh. there is obviously original material on your mixtape as well, but yeah. a majority, a lot of it is you on other. It's a classic mixtape. It's you on other people's beats and stuff yeah. like that, and yeah. you know, doing covers and whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, just on the mixtapes alone, how many did you sell? Thirteen so thousand. 13,000? Yeah. And that's just you doing them. I mean, yeah, in the UK, that's quite a lot, considering that you're doing that on, yeah. your, on your own speed. Um, and what, do, you know, what was the inspiration for you to really think, OK, I'm not going to go in the studio straight away. I'm going to do, do, you know, get a mixtape and get, get out there. What, I mean, is that an idea borrowed from the States, probably? Um, the whole mixtape thing, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an American idea. American. But, like, usually with mixtapes from American artists, it's tracks that never made it to their album or tracks that are going to be really big and they play like two seconds of it, wheel it back and throw sound effects all over it. Yeah. And a lot of artists... What, is that a clearance issue? Um, it was just, you know, just like go and buy the album. Yeah, you like yeah. this track, I play it for two seconds, wheel it back, you go and buy the album. Like, yeah, you understand? Yeah, yeah. It's just a way, it was a marketing tool. And, but in the UK, people were getting the wrong idea. They were copying that style, but nobody cared about the music, if that makes any sense. So if you do a track, and you, and you play two seconds of it and you put sound effects all over it, 
if, if you're not Jay-Z, no one's going to want to buy the album because they're like, I didn't even hear the track. No one's going to care, you know? So I've done it in a different way of where I put like a lot of full songs, you know, songs. It was like practically on the two mixtapes together, there's like four albums worth of original material mm. that I could put out, you know, and, and call it an album. And another thing that I've done was, was a, a lot of marketing for myself mm. in the sense that like a lot of hip hop records that are big in America are often big in the UK like three months later, yeah. three months to six months down the line. Mm -hmm. And um, there was that um, Jay Kwan dude that done the tune Tipsy. He done a tune called Tipsy. I know that his record label in the UK, um, I can't remember what, I think they, I can't remember what record label it was, but I know they had um, an a office in the UK. So I knew that this record, this was before it was big in the UK, I knew that this record was going to get a major push in the UK. I knew it was going to be like posters. I knew there was going to be a, a radio campaign on it. So I thought if I do an alternate version, a UK version, maybe every DJ that gives it, that the record label give it to, they'll play my version right after. So I've done my version called Pepsi, which was about not getting tipsy, it was about, you know, people you know, pissing all over the toilet and stuff, you know, at house parties, you know, because he done a video about a house party and it was all going well. I've done a track about the house party going terrible, you know, like, so I've done that. I gave it to all the DJs and it was just crazy in the yeah, UK. Blew up. Every year, every, every, anywhere you heard Tipsy, right after, you'd hear Pepsi. Version. Straight after and everybody would, you know, DJs would wheel it up, you know, and like, so, the more money and the more marketing, the record label, they didn't even know this. They were promoting me. They didn't even know this for free. Like, everywhere, s someone would say, yeah, have you heard the Jaquan Tipsy? People say, nah, but have you heard Sway Pepsi? You know, and that's how I really, and I started doing that. And then another thing was, you know, I'm, I won't lie, yeah, Americans, a lot of the rappers and that, they start, to, they take the piss in the UK. Take the piss, you know, turn up late for shows, you know. So, you know, like, I wanted to let a lot of people from America know that, you know, you can't keep on taking the piss when our currency is actually a bit, a bit stronger than yours. Mm. You understand? So, like, they done, um, they done a competition for Nas's album. It was called um, the Streets Disciple competition. Yeah. You, know, you know Thieves Theme, the, the album Thieves Theme was on. And they were like, they were like yeah, so they, all the UK artists, you know, get in this competition to be on Nas's UK release. And me personally, I thought that was a bit of a piss take. If it's yeah. Nas's proper album and Nas respects you, He's gonna holler at you and let you be on his album, but to do a competition to exploit the UK market, I thought was a piss take. So yeah, I done. You should, be, you should be on the album full stop. Exactly. Not the album, if yeah. if Nas like don't try and exploit the market, and there was a lot of like good rappers that was entering this competition, and I, you know I was speaking to some people like this is a kids thing, man. You can't enter a competition to be on an album. Just do your own thing. But I, however, did enter the competition, but the version of Thieves theme that I gave in was not what they expected. You know, I didn't enter to win, I entered to let people know that, look, Yanks need to stop taking the piss when it comes to hip hop. So, mm. I've done a version called The Rubbers Theme, and I'll play that to you now. Yeah, we've got to hear that. Yeah. Because that definitely blew up as well. Yeah, yeah, that one, that done quite well in the UK. I don't know what I'm doing. The pound is stronger than the dollar. Yeah, it starts with the line, the pound is stronger than the dollar. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. 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 As you might have gathered, I never won the competition or nothing. Well, you know, made an impact. Right. Yeah, definitely. So, um, Tell me a little bit about, you know, the variety of styles that you've grown up with musically and what your background is and that kind of thing. Um, like, growing up, I was into all different kinds of music, you know, like, from, like, groups like Madness, which is a really big UK group. That's one of my favourite groups of all time. Anything from Madness to Bone Thugs in Harmony. Very into Bone Thugs in Harmony, you know, like, mm. like another, another thing. Like, a lot of people didn't understand what they were saying. You know, I used to rewind and try and, you know, find out what they were saying. Proper Bone Thugs in Harmony fam. But on the flip side, I was into George Michael, you know, like, you know, I, had, I won't lie, I had the CD, you know, when the, when the boys used to come around, I hide it, you know, I hide the CD, but, you know, I'd play it when no one was around, you get me, like, just to get 
that kind of, you know, like different diversity. I was into drum and bass. Uh, my cousins do drum and bass. Like they like part of the Metalheads um, click, mm -hmm. you know, which like, kind of blew up like like five, ten years back ago. Um, ago. Who is that? Um, Ink, DJ Ink and Loxy. Right, right. You know, they're, they're my family members. That uh, and you know, like they're under Goldie and that. So it's like all different kinds of music, man. I didn't discriminate, man. I was really into MC Hammer. I won't lie. You get me, MC Hammer. Criss Cross, you name it. Music with a lot of commercial appeal, you know, but at the same time I could get down with NWA. I wasn't like, you get me, I was never anything fake. You know, a lot of people were fake, you know, like they pretended that they were only into the hardcore because they thought they were them kind of people. Mm. I know what kind of person I am, so I can listen to the hell what I want, you know, and no one's going to tell me shit, you know. So, mm. yeah, we're very broad-minded about music from rock to hip-hop and that. And another thing, is that I was born in London. I was born in London, but my parents are from West Africa, a place called Ghana. And when I was born, like about um, like a couple months later, I was taken to Ghana. I stayed there for a couple of years. I came back just in time to start school. So when I came back, I was heavily, I had a strong African accent, you know, like I was heavily, um, like very African morals within me. At the same time, when growing up, I learned to adapt to the whole British culture. And that's something that comes out in, in you know, both of my styles. One thing about being an artist, if you're going to stand out, you can't sound like anybody. Like, people are going to make comparisons forever. You know, you need someone to make a comparison and you need to see it as a positive thing. When I first come out and people were like, uh, you know, UK, Ludacris, Slick Rick, um, Dizzy, you know, I was getting a lot of comparisons and I was getting angry. I was like, what the fuck are they talking about? I'm sway, like, why do they keep on making these comparisons? Mm. But after a while, you realize, number one, <coughs> people need to identify you by something in order to, you know, yeah. to get, get their mind around it. And number two, when people are ident like comparing you to acts on a big caliber, you need to know that, you know, it's, it's somewhere where you can go and they're seeing you on a big level. As a compliment. You know, yeah, as a compliment. If people were comparing me to, like, you know, crap acts, this is where you need to start questioning them, like, what are you talking about? But, like, you know, to be compared to some of the biggest acts in hip-hop was a good thing for me, you know? So, um, yeah, the elements you've got, as an artist, you've got to take the elements that make you. Nobody's going to have the same, exact same, um, combination of elements. You, one of your dads, might, your dad might be Polish, your mum might be Swedish, and you were born in, you know, Zambia or something like that. You know, you got to put that all into your music, because you know, 50 Cent's dad ain't Polish and mum. You understand? Like, he's not going to have the same kind of style as you. You need to put all your, your personal heritage and stuff into your music. Create yourself a niche, and that's what I did. You know, there was no one doing what I done, like merging the whole African with the British humour, along with the um, American influences within hip-hop. And that's why I managed to, like, you know, get, get, get through a lot more. Uh -huh. And let's talk about, you know, finding your identity musically, because certainly with hip-hop, it's very significant for... Because you're, you're basically the first generation in the UK mm -hmm. that have really spoke on records mm -hmm. like you speak in real life. Yeah, yeah, Do you definitely. know what I mean? It's like... They, you know, in the UK, we went through quite a few years of people wanting to sound very um, as American as possible. Mm. You know, when they're mm. recording hip hop, and um, you know, how important is that to you to just represent? Because in a way, the whole point of hip hop has always been about representing where you're from, anyway. Exactly, that's, that's hip hop for you, man. And you know, a lot of I don't like I don't you know I don't want to feel like I'm slagging off Americans all the time, <laughs> but you know, a lot of you lot don't respect you know, and a, a big American rapper came to London recently. I'm not going to say his name. You know, he came to, uh, he, he requested, not even that big, he's all right. But like, he requested to see me and he was like, you know, he came over and he was like, yeah, I heard, you know, the hardest thing and blah, blah. And the first thing I said to him was, you know what, you don't respect. Like, a lot of you don't respect, you know, and he kind of threw him off. We called the meeting off and everything. He went wherever he went and I went where I went. But sometimes you've got to let people know. You understand, like, um, a lot of TV, like MTV for us, you turn on um, TV in Britain, a lot of American programs. We get everything, don't get it twisted. We've got um, Sex in the City, we've got Seinfeld, Fraser, everything, Simpsons, whatever. A lot of American crap on the TV, yeah? So naturally, you know, when you do entertainment yourself, 
you mimic what your idea of entertainment. You know what I mean? Like, for example, one of the biggest acts to come out of the UK and, and do hip hop, Slick Rick. You know, but when he, when he went over, his accent was there, but he took in the American culture a lot. And the, the thing that separated him from a lot of people was that he had the British, you know, a little bit of the twang. He never had it that strong. Mm. He had a little bit of the twang, and um, he had the humour, the British humour, and he was doing the American stuff, so it was like something different for them. Mm. There's another crew called SAS, you know, who, who was destined to do a big thing. So, you know, Dash came over, he missed them about a bit, you know, Dash was saying he was going to, Damon Dash, saying he was going to sign them and all that, and he never, so they ended up rolling with Dipset, now they're like, UK, like, they represent Dipset in the UK, they're doing their thing, and it's like a lot of American artists are now realising that, look, mm. British boys have got something going on, and everybody wants their DTP UK, and, you know, Def Jam UK, there's a lot of things going on, so it's important that I speak the way I speak, and make sure that you lot understand, because over the years we've learned how to understand how a lot of you lot speak, mm. you know, it's, it's equally as hard to understand what a lot of American rappers are saying as, as it is to understand what a lot of British people are saying. But well, come work together and work at it. And do you think, what, what's the potential for it to cross over and break out of, you know, because even within the UK, a mm. lot of the music that you've been talking about and the artists that you've been talking about are very London-centric. Yeah, definitely. You know? And so it's about, like, you know, what's the potential to break out of London into the UK, one, and then two, into the rest of the world? Um, out of London into the UK, you need to have that X factor. You need to be, you need to have something different that's going to transcend. Because London is London, and Coventry is Coventry. You, you like, you can't just say Great Britain and that's it. Mm. They're very different societies, very different culturally. You know, London's very multicultural. Very like, there's everybody over there, black, white, Asian, you name it, all in London. But a lot of other places in Britain is mainly a white population, mm. you know, excluding Birmingham, Manchester, you know. The so, major cities, basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Most of the major cities are very multicultural. So a lot of artists forget that sometimes, you know, and they're kind of caught in their street zone. When they make music, they're making music purely for the streets and, and you know, the, the subject matters and everything that someone living in on a farm in Coventry can't, can't relate to, you know. Mm. He might have a gun as well, but it might be a different type of gun and he'll be shooting, you know, cows instead of people, you know, so, like, he can't relate to what people are talking about in the manor all the time. Mm -hmm. So, when artists remember that and they start talking about universal topics, that's when you, you know, it transcends into the UK. Mm -hmm. And as far as breaking out, nobody in the UK has really broke, broke out properly. Like, yeah, this is like, you know, on a, on a hip-hop level, on, a, on an urban level, I should say. No one's really done that. So there's still opportunity for someone to come out and do that. I don't know who it might be, <laughs> but there's still opportunity for someone to come out and do that. So, and I think that not just Americans, but people around the world in general, you know, Germany, France, Sweden, are getting their head around mm. the fact that we're going to keep our accents and we're going to do what we're doing, mm. you know, and we're going to be taken seriously. Because, you know, you ask, you know, ask Mar Mario Winans how serious London is. He'll tell you, because he didn't go back with his jewellery, you know, like, um, who else, Ja Rule, you know, that, that guitar chain he had, you know, someone was wearing it around the corner from me, you know, I know the person that, that took it, you know, he came back to America and he got another one made, I'm telling you this as a fact, you know, Ja Rule got rubbed, that bare face, I was there when it happened, you understand, like, a lot of people, when they come to, like, when they leave and come back to America, they don't tell everybody what it's like, you know, they don't tell everybody, but I'm telling you firsthand as a Londoner, it's not no joke, you know, we're people to be taken seriously, you know, and we're not going to stop doing what we're doing until we start getting taken seriously, you know what I mean? And so, while we're on the subject of London and other artists, you know, that are coming up now, I mean, there's a lot of um, press around the world about the grime scene, mm. and, you know, I mean, maybe you could just articulate that for people that don't have first-hand knowledge of grime and UK hip-hop and where everything fits in your mind. Okay, right, now... There's two, there's a war going on in the UK right now, and it's between two scenes which are very similar. Now, I don't come into this war because apparently I'm both of them, the styles of music. You've got grime and you've got UK hip hop. Now, a good, I don't know if anybody's heard of Black Twang. Anyone heard of Black Twang? 
should be a good representative of UK hip hop. You know, like good UK hip hop, not like fake UK hip hop, good UK hip hop. That's Black Twan. And then you've got, let me say someone else, I keep on saying this guy. Um, who else? Let me think who else is. Have you heard of Wiley? Wiley. He's a good representation of Grime. So you've got Wiley on one side and Black Twang on the other. Now, Grime is a very street music. It's very street in that, you know, you could have like five words in a whole verse for Grime. And, you know, this is, uh, this is a quote from a, from a really big Grime rap Ah, uh, I'll crack your skull. Ah, uh, I'll crack your skull. And he just keeps on saying it. And everybody goes mad for it. You know, like, and you know, like, what else is there? There's lots of, like, there's a lot of, grime is really grimy. You know, it's, it's real street music. Give us, give us some other, give us some other grime hooks. Grime hooks? Yeah. Um, you don't want to bring Arms House, I'll bring arm ha Arms House to your mum's house. <laughs> you don't want to bring Arms House, what else is there? You know, killer, killer, real, real, killer, killer, still, still. If you don't like killer, killer, you can suck your mum. This is quotes from, you know, grime artists. You know, there's a lot of, you know, grime is, Crazy, like it's you know when you see the energy of grime and it's, it's a very street music. Whereas UK hip hop is more laid back, intellectual type lyrics. Mm. You know it's the difference between um, 50 Cent and the Roots mm. kind of thing. But it's also a tempo thing as well. It is tempo. It is a tempo. Like grime is very energetic and fast. You know it's a, it's it's good. It's a breakthrough music. It's often about and what like 140 BPM. 135 to 140, yeah, yeah like BPM. Whereas, but a lot of hip hop stuff. It's starting to become that tempo through the dirty south stuff. Exactly. You know, a lot of hip hop. And that's stuff. where the crossovers come, certainly in the UK, mm. because a lot of the grime people relate a lot to crunk. Yeah. Kind oh of yeah. Yeah. Little little John came over and he loved grime. You know, like he was, you know, at all the grime events and everything. Like it's, that's like half that thing. Exactly. It's a very similar type of music. Um, I could play you an example of a track that kind of sits on both sides, UK hip hop and grime. And this is a track that everybody related to because it was like, it was, I made it to be like an anthem for the UK. You know, it's me featuring my guy Pirelli and it's called Up Your Speed, meaning, you know, just get off your ass and do something. You know, like not up your speed on the road or drive faster, but has anyone heard of um, Fleetwood Mac? Fleetwood Mac, yeah. We, we interpolated the Fleetwood, a track called The Chain by Fleetwood Mac which they cleared surprisingly because I've been and doing a lot of interpolations that people don't clear so we got it cleared shot a video for it and everything and it's called up your speed oh. that's a perfect example of UK hip hop <laughs> We talked about grime, we talked about UK hip hop, but basically, I mean, when it comes down to it, the importance, especially after you've been talking about America and all that stuff, I mean, really, the reason you're bringing all that up is because it's important to build something yourself. Yeah, definitely, and, and man. build your own scene, and that's, and that's what we're talking about here, right? Mm. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're from Venezuela or Sweden or whatever, basically, it's do you. Yeah. You know what, like, bottom line is, if you build, build up and create your own undeniable hype, People are going to be onto you, man. You can't go to these record labels, especially these major record labels. It doesn't make no sense. And you have to realize that this is where people, a lot of artists get twisted and they get their feelings hurt. A record label, particularly a major one, is a business. That's all it is, a business, a way of making money. You understand? They sell chocolate bars, if that makes any sense. You know, they don't know what they're made of. Don't give a toss who made them. As long as the people that come into the store like the chocolate bars, and they'll sell it to you. They don't care what's in them, anything. They sell chocolate bars, just like the man in the store, in the, on the corner. He sells chocolate bars. He don't give a toss who made it or what it's made of. I'm saying that's a record label. Now, what you've got to do for record labels is you've got to build up a demand for your chocolate bar. You have to, you know, give people a taster, let people taste it, so they can go to the store and say, yeah, I like this. Or, you know, and you've got to make your own one. So, mm. that's basically what I did, man, like... But, but... I, Go on. I was involved in, like, I came up through the battle scene before, before 8 Mile came out and it got all commercial, like, like there was a battle scene in the UK and I, I was part of it, I was doing my thing on that, you know, because I was good at, you know, cussing kids, like, you know, that as a kid in school, you know, people didn't really want to chat shit to me because I'd just embarrass you, you know, I was just that type of kid, you know, I, like, dedicate the whole lesson to embarrassing you, you know, like, I'd done that and once I learned how to rhyme, 
it was a dangerous combination of being able to cuss people while rhyming at the same time. And I took that combination to the battle stage and hurt a lot of feelings, you know. And after a while, it was like, after a while, it got overrated, you know, everyone was getting involved and I just ducked out. I ducked out blissfully because I didn't want to be known as a battle MC. I wanted people to know that, you know. Mm. A lot of the tracks you've heard today, in fact, all of the tracks you've heard today, I produced them myself. I was actually into production, you know, like mm. before rapping. I was very into, you know, I've, I got a four track when I was like 14, beatboxed one part, then done the bass line with my mouth on the second track, you know, and then done the hi-hats on the third track and just rapped all over the fourth track. I was very into that. I had like some Fostex, some old Fostex four track that I had for like five years. And then after a while when I left school, started doing what I needed to do, got some money and bought myself an MPC and started building on that. So now like, I don't sample a lot in my music. A lot of my stuff, if, if I get an idea, I get a bass line, someone that plays the bass to come and play the bass line. I get a guitarist to come and, you know, do the, or uh, someone that can actually play keys to come and do that. So a lot of my music has got a live element feel at the mm. same time an electrical feel because you know I dabble with things myself mm. so it's you know what it's not about waiting for the record labels man and for the UK I'm a perfect example of some, someone not waiting for the record labels now like potentially I've got an option of like five record labels I could go to tomorrow including three majors you know and two major independents you know everyone is interested in taking my whole decipher imprint because of what I built up you know it's um I've, I've proved that I could, I could make eight out of ten people like what I'm doing once exposed to it, and so that can multiply. The way they see it is if you can make eight out of ten people do it, you can make 16 out of 20, and, and, and so on. You understand? So you just have to, even if you're in a small environment of people that are not really into your kind of music, you've got to exploit yourself within your environment. That's how you get ripples. You cause ripples, mm -hmm. and it transcends into other markets. That's all I can say, man. You know, like... The independent way is the best way, is the best way forward for people that want to be good creatively. If you want to be a pop band and you know you just want to sing songs that other people have wrote for you, then fair enough, go to a record label, I'm pretty sure they've got a million songs and songwriters that sit there all day writing, you know, formulas like, that are going to do well, you know, if you're good looking and all that, you can do that. On the other hand, you know, like, you know, like I'm very creative and, you know, I don't want anybody telling me anything about my music. so. The only way I can prove to people that my music is what's gonna, gonna be going on is by letting the people talk, and that's what I've done. Mm. I gave it straight to the people, and the people gave it to the press, and the press gave it to the labels. That's how it worked. But you didn't just give it to the people. I mean, you were literally were everywhere for a while. Yeah. Right? And, and it's kind of a mate. How old are you? 23. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're 23 and you've basically got the game sussed, well, yeah. certainly from London perspective, better than most people 10 years your senior that are artists, you know, I mean, it's an amazing situation to be where basically you are doing completely you, mm -hmm. purely you, and, and being you and doing what you do creatively, but, you know, you've already talked about, like, including subject matters so that you can bring in people outside your immediate surroundings, mm -hmm. you know, you've already talked about kind of getting thinking I'm going to do this record because I know it's going to get promotion and therefore I'm going to get promotion I mean a lot of what you're doing especially with the mixtapes and the way that you've achieved what you've achieved so far so young has been very calculated and clever yeah. and sussing out the business I mean how how are you so business savvy at such an early stage in your career it's a lot of business like I like I gave the whole chocolate analogy is common sense you know people like it they buy it it's that simple, you know, there's no weird science to it, no nothing. But in order to get people to like it, they have to be exposed to it. So you've got to expose it to the people. If they like it, you take it. It's really, it's really simple. You know, it's play school stuff. I can tell a three-year-old this stuff. You know, a lot of people get caught up in the whole industry. You don't have to learn everything about the technical side about you know, what companies or agencies I should sign to. Just make your music, make your music. There's people that go to university and study these things. Manager, management, there's lots of people in the equation that could be doing those stuff for you, them things for you. Like, like, so you just have to focus on your music and make sure the music you're creating is original, stand out, and what, the most important thing is music that you enjoy and music that you're happy with. You know, because if you're making music 
that you don't enjoy, it, 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 it's detectable. Mm. You know, you can see someone who's, you know, making music for the money and they don't usually get that far. You know, you can mm. see people that are doing it for the passion. It's a combination of things and I forgot to say, luck. I don't get it twisted, you know, you could be the most talented person in the world with the most amazing songs. If you play it to a crowd of people who can't do anything for you, then you, you're fucked, basically. You know, luck mm. will put a person who knows a person who knows a person in that room of 10 people for you. Mm. So you have to create your own luck in that you've got to give yourself loads of avenues. You know, you can't just, you know, just be in one place and hope that someone's going to be there. You need to be like you said, I was everywhere for a while, you know, I was on a lot of people's tracks. I was on every, I was in every club selling the CDs, outside every club selling the CDs, you know. That's a good point because, you know, when you're talking about work rate, mm. you definitely not too cool for school. Yeah, of course, Do you know what of course I mean? not. You're you know? there giving the CD out outside the club, you're there everywhere. You, you weren't too cool to do any of that yeah. stuff, you know. You, you shouldn't you be. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, your work ethics on that level. A lot of artists have got their whole mind frames caught up in, you know, their whole pride thing like, I don't have to be outside a club selling a CD, but they don't sell in the stores either. So what do you want to do? You just want to sit there with a box of CDs? Like, what, what's your problem? You know, like, I, I didn't want to sit there with a box of CDs, so I thought I'd go directly to the people. I take my little discman that there and play it to people. Or if I'm in a car, I play it to people through the car and be like, do you like this, blah, blah. And I play them the stuff that I like the most. You know, and that's how I saw I, I rarely miss the cell. I rarely, rarely miss the cell. All right, so this whole thing, like, I can still, it's getting a bit dangerous now, but every now and then, when I can read the crowd well, I'll go into the crowd after a show, you know, speak with the people, you know, see what they appreciate. People are like, mm -hmm. I like this lyric of yours, way. I like that track, why don't you make it a single, you know? But mm -hmm. only recently I've been, you know, getting into confrontations into the crowd because, you know, you've got people that don't like to see you doing well. You know, but you know, this is mm. just life. That's just life. But yeah, man, yeah, that whole two. I'm not like, don't go on like you're something you're not. Mm. Understand? You like a lot of people go on like divas before their time. Mm. Understand? You ain't made no money. You ain't done shit. You're nothing. You know, you got to remember that at this moment in time, you need people more than people need you. Understand? Like, whatever it takes. If you have to be a runner in a studio making tea for people, do it. Swallow your pride and do it. It's nothing. You're making tea for people that are in a higher position than you. And another thing I tell people, yeah, if someone's in a higher position than you, yeah, never make them feel threatened. You know, don't go into a record label and, and let people know you know everything. Because the minute you do that, they feel threatened and they don't feel in a, a posi position of power and they just shun you, they push you to the side. You've got to go in dumb. You understand? You've got to go in dumb. You've got to make people feel like they're teaching you something. You know, that's the way they take you under the wing. They take you under the wing, before they know it, you pass them, you move on to the next person. Act all dumb. You know, understand? That's, that's, how, that's, that's life. You act all dumb. You know, I'm only telling you lot this. You know, I, I'm only telling you lot this. Like, I knew a lot of stuff about the music industry before I got into it properly. You know? But I played dumb with a lot of people. I, I, I acted like I didn't know what I was doing half of the time. Mm. I acted like everything was luck. You know, people, like, people didn't know I calculated the whole Pepsi thing. You know, people thought it was just a beat I came and spat over. I knew it was going to be big. I've done my research. I saw it was big in America. I knew it was the next, I was looking for the next big thing. You understand? So don't, one, one real rule is people in a position of power, please don't make them feel threatened. Because once you do that, you ruin your chances of going past them. You know, because they're on, they're on edge and they're going to be, you know, alert to what you're dealing with. So, yeah, man. That's just my tips for you lot. Right? Oh, you got a lot of things sussed. Yeah. A lot of people probably sitting there thinking, like, he's only 23, what's he talking about? But I'm only 23 and I've done it, innit? So you've got to listen. <laughs> Understand? Like, I've I done it, yeah. Like, it's not even just it, you know. Yeah. Definitely. And one, yeah. one thing that I think is amazing is that you've done it, but totally on your own terms. Yeah. Like, you're not in any box. Mm -hmm. you, you could literally do anything tomorrow and people yeah. would accept it because they don't say, oh, no, 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 he only does, like, grime. Grime, exactly. Or he only does soul or he only does hip-hop. How do you avoid the box? But when I first done this mixtape, see, basically, this is, um, two, you can see the two front covers of the mixtape. The first mixtape, the initial idea was to let it sell for three months, make enough money to make the money back and then make the next one. But it sold for longer than three months. When I was ready with the next one, I was going to the stores and they still ordering the first one. So it didn't make sense putting the, the second one in the store. So I let it 
branch out for longer and stuff like that. It's like, um, and on the mixtapes, there's a range of different styles from fast to really slow to grime to hip hop to drum and bass. Mm. All of my influences came out on the mixtapes, and it's, it's like me just throwing all ideas together. Not perf I'm a perfectionist, but I had to swallow my pride on the mixtapes and experiment. You understand? I had to f put things out there that I wasn't 100% sure of within my heart. I had to do that. There's a lot of people that are in their bedrooms crafting the most best masterpiece ever, which will never come out because they don't know when it's got to that masterpiece stage. You understand? Like, I had to swallow my pride and just really get rid of my, my, my perfectionist self and just say, look, I've done this track. I need to know what people, how people feel about it. Mm -hmm. And trust me, people's opinions could manipulate how you feel about your own music, believe it or not. You know, like if you make a track that you're not certain of, there's a reason why you're not certain of it. Because you've got the capacity to love it and you've got the capacity to hate it. You know, and sometimes people out there make that decision for you. Understand? So you don't have to be, feel embarrassed or feel like you don't know what you're doing if, if you're not sure about a track. There's a reason why it, it was made in your mind, because on somewhere along the line you were liking it, or you you liked the direction you was going in. So mm. I'm not, I don't believe in people, you know, holding back material, waiting for the to lay it all out there. And the more, like I said to him, like, the more lottery tickets you buy, the more chance there is of you winning the lottery. You understand? You buy one ticket, you got one chance of winning. It's as simple as that. Come up with an idea. It's good enough, quality-wise, well presented, well presented. Put it out there. Give it to people. Give it to DJ. Get feedback, get opinion, get people talking about you to other people, and so on. So that's so you basically would just didn't pigeonhole yourself I didn't. early on, and that's the key. Mm. Is the early bit. It is. It, your first impressions are really important. You know, first impressions because sometimes first impressions are really hard to erase. If you come in a certain way, people expect you to maintain that sort of style, that mm. certain type of style. You know, so. You know, like some people can't come out of the type of music they make. Mm. You know, and I've, I've, I've worked with a lot of people like that. You know, mm. like that make a certain style of music, and you can tell that they want to come out of that box, but they're scared of how the public are going to feel. How thick is your skin when it comes to like criticism? Um, in the beginning, I, I was taking criticism bad. Like, I won't lie to you, like, the first track I put out was a track that your radio station championed. Mm. It was called St um, On My Own. You know, it was the first track that, after the whole battle thing, people were like, so I could do a track like that? Like, it was a very personal track, very dark, very about my life at the time, things I was saying in that track that I don't agree with. And it was very personal. And I remember a magazine, a journalist from a magazine, you know, really dissing it, you know, really going at me. Like, I don't know who this guy was or where he was from, but for some reason he didn't like me, and I thought it was on a personal level. And for a minute, we were going to look for him. You know, we were going to look for him, you know, and make him, you know, change the article. We was actually, you know, I was really considering looking for this guy, chasing up people, you know, he, but we were, you know, chasing him in a good way. We're like, you know, I really want to speak to this guy, you know, talk about doing some work, and people were giving us the contact. You know, when it came to the point, I thought, all right, either, you know, hurt this guy and have everybody label me a thug in the industry, and, you know, you get, now, because in Britain, it's not like America. You can't bully your way in the industry. They just call the police, and you, that's you. you. Understand? Like, you can't go into a record label and, <laughs> and go and like sign me. They'll just be like, no, all right, put 999. It's 911. It's 999. Um, Sway's here making noise. I'll go to prison. So, like, you, you just have to be normal, man. I just thought, all right, I'm gonna swallow it. If I ever meet him, I'm gonna tell him what I think about him. I'm not gonna touch him. Yeah, and that's that's how it was. But after a while, a lot of people started giving me good reviews. I still get the odd ball every now and then that can't, doesn't understand me. And so when people don't understand things, it's, you know, it's just whack. And I've got a lot of people, up and comers around me, that are going through what I was going through with mm. these people, you know. You're going to get bad criticism. You're going to get bad feedback. And it's the funny thing about it, yeah, about getting negative criticism, is that nine out of ten people can say that your track is the most best, the wonderfulest track they've ever heard in their life. That one person that says the track shit is the person that you're gonna be interested in the most. It's the one that's gonna throw you off. And it's the one, it's actually the guy you're gonna to listen to. You're gonna be angry and hurt. Don't think that way. Think about the nine people that like your track. You understand? And, and if it's good music, remember he's outnumbered. 
Nine out, like, come on, man. Like, I used to get that all the time. Get loads of good reviews and one bad one will come up and it will ruin my whole day. But, you know, you forget about the good ones easily. Like, when something's good, just realise, you know, mm. just clock the ratios. When you get nine bad ones and one good one, that's when you need to, you know, f you go to university or something, start finding a job to do. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's that simple, so... We've got a lot of producers in this room and yeah. um, it'd definitely be of interest to know, you know, that you're not just... On the material that we've been hearing, you're not just um, on mm. the mic, you're on the boards as boards, well. Boards, yeah. I mean, you produced most of your own stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's amazing that you're basically the businessman, the, you know, the entrepreneur, the MC and the producer mm. all in one. Yeah. Uh, can you tell me a bit about producing and, and your, your take on that and what's important to you when it comes to producing music? To me, it's all the same game. Production, rapping, it's the same game. Rapping is like, my mouth is just another instrument to me. You know, the words I use are just other keys. That's how it works, like, it's the same thing. Like, you'll find a lot of producers, a lot of rappers can produce. And you'll find a lot of producers can rap. A lot of them make beats and do raps in their head. You know, never let it out. Or they like, they make a beat and they'll think, this guy would sound good over it. And they start rapping someone else's lyrics in their head. That means you've got the capacity to rap, you understand? And mm. as a true musician, makes the music and, you know, does the lyrics, everything. That's, that's, a, it's because of the way the industry is now, it's kind of surprising to find someone who raps and produces and plays an instrument. That's mm. like amazing, because the industry's gone so um, poppy and, you know, like, just so artificial. It's actually amazing to find something as simple as that. That's, as far as I'm concerned, if you, if you, like, write the songs, you should be able to sing them. That's just my mentality, you understand? If you, if you can't sing that song, just don't write it, you know, like, you know, don't, don't write for other people, like, giving your ideas and stuff to other people. It's, a, it's your personality that's going into the music, so you go in and deal with that yourself. Mm. You know, so, yeah, what was the original question? Well, <laughs> with the production thing, what did you, you know, seeing as we're talking about the do-it-yourself ethic, mm. uh. like, what basic equipment did you make all of the original mixtape stuff on? I mean, you must have been, what, like, 17, 18 then? Yeah, well, no, no. Like, I've been working on an MPC since I was 16. Like, but I only use the MPC for the drums. I don't use it for anything else. Every now and then, like, if I ain't got enough space or anything, I like sample through what I've done onto the MPCs and just put the whole beat on there. But as far as I'm concerned, I've tried a lot of other modules out for drum, and MPCs are the best. Um, sound module-wise, I use a Novation for bass line whenever I'm playing stuff. JV 1080. Um, I've got a couple of other sound modules. I'm not really, I'm a bit scared of that whole everything on a computer thing. Like, that kind of messes with my head. I can't, I can't, can't comprehend it. I can't get around it yet. So I still use a lot of things and sync them up. How, you know, how, how when, you, when, you're, when you're 23 and you've, and you've had, like, you know, street success and mm -hmm. music, musical people love what you're doing. And, uh -huh and you've got a lot of play on specialist radio and you want to go to the next stage and you've got five different labels, three of whom are major labels who in the UK now aren't really signing anyone. Yeah, they yeah. don't think, you know, there's no one's getting signed no that, that isn't, you know, truly pop. To have those deals on the table, you know, how are you able to just walk away from that and say, you know what, no, I'm not, I'm not really ready for that yet? It's, it's got to a point now, I need, to, you know, I need to see how this does in February in order to sign to any of these you're, boys. But you're putting it out yourself Yeah, well, it's, coming out, it's coming out on my own label. And how do you afford to but make an album, you know, that, you know, that's mar properly mastered? The music pays like... for itself after a while. Yeah. You just need to get that initial money. The, the first mixtape I got, I, I, I was selling, paid for the second mixtape, which helped pay for the video and pay for recording of the album. You understand? And, you know, you get, it's a snowball effect. In the beginning, when I, when I dropped my first mixtape, I never even had a manager. You know, everyone was phoning me direct. Magazines were phoning me direct, and you know, I speak to them. And um, I never had a press guy. I got press. I got, I probably out of the urban artists, I've got the most press in the UK. Like people are so interested in what I'm doing. Did you do the little Derek song? No, nah, I yeah. didn't produce that. Oh, that's, right. that's produced by Shots. Mm. Well, let's let's check that yeah. out because that's that's cool. the next single, right? Yeah, Shots is um. He's the guy I was telling you about, who plays all the instruments, you know, he's really, you know, good. And I told him what I wanted for the song, what type of feel I wanted to go for. I came back the next day and he'd come up with that beat, with the little Derek And what did, what did you tell him? 
I told him, I told him I wanted the harpsichords. You know, I told him I wanted something very vintage. You know, a very British feel to it. Mm. But at the same time, I'm very into West Coast music. Like as far as that American, I'm very into the West Coast. Like DJ Quick is one of my best producers of all time. One of my favorites. Like DJ Quick, nothing's mm. messing with them kind of boys there. Like, and so I told him I wanted like a live bass line. A lot of West Coast people they do live bass instrumentation, mm -hmm. but I wanted it to move like my flow. You understand? I wanted it to move like how I flow, and this is what he came up with, and this is what I've done over it. The track's called Little Derek, because my real name is Derek, and it's about me growing up. The track is right around here. Uh, who's the guest MC on that one? Um, a girl called Baby Blue. Uh, one of the hottest female rappers in the UK right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, I've done a lot of work with her. So apart from the album coming out in February, what does the future hold for Sway? Where would you like to, what would you like to be doing in three years' time? Um, films. Really, really, really into films. Like, I'm really into, like, as you could probably guess from my rap style, I'm very, you know, dramatical. Mm. Um, you know, like, I'm really, like, films is the next step for me, as far as writing them. I, I've been stuck on one for like four years, like writing one. It'll finally get finished one day, but I kind of like go to it, write a bit, come back the next day, write, leave it for a couple of weeks, write it. Mm. I'm not going to say what it's called, but it's probably going to be like my first ever film. And what, as a screenwriter? Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm writing it like how I write my songs. The way it is, it's very poetic. It's a very poetic film. Like the way people are going to be speaking, everyone's going to sound like me in the mm. film, mm. if that makes any sense. But different personalities <coughs> than me. It's going to be weird. I don't want to talk too much about it because it's not done, and I'm kind of stuck on the scene right now, so it's frustrating. But yeah, films, music. Like this, this is my demo project. That's exactly what it was intended to be. My demo project. You know, I want. I want. I really want to see the response of it. I want to see how well it does, how far it goes, and that's how I. That's how I, I learn off that. You know, go off that. There's um, a lot of set-up songs on there, meaning, for example, that pretty ugly husband, the one with the man beating up. On the second album, the track is getting done again. It's done, done again, but it's from the kid's perspective. Now, there was a kid involved in that story that I don't mention, you know, but if you hear the, the man gets shot at the end, mm -hmm. and it's actually the kid that does it. So it's going to be the same story exactly again but with the child, from the, instead of rapping as the husband, beating up the wife, mm. rapping as the child, witnessing all of this happen, you know, and like, this continuation on my third mm. album as well. I do a lot of planning, and I do a lot of writing beforehand, a lot of tracks. I, they were, I wrote them in 2002 to 2003. I've moved on and done new tracks, but they can't come out until all of the other stuff is exploited, because I feel it's good enough to go. I'm very into people being real, and... What are some of the artists that you feel that, represent that? That represent being real. Mm. What are the people that you look to, other people that you rate at the moment? American or... It doesn't matter. It's anywhere. Music, yeah. <sighs> Tech Nine. I like Tech Nine a lot. Don't know if, you, if you've heard of him. You not heard of Tech Nine? Yeah, yeah that's the first. Um, what else is there? Not that many people, you know. Tech Nine. <laughs> uh, sugar Free. Who else would you rep from, you know, the London and perhaps North London scene that other people should hear about here? Um, Pirelli, my protege, not even my protege, I shouldn't even call him that, my partner, Pirelli, he's, he's like, he's something different. He's a lot more abstract than me. You've called him your favourite rapper in the past, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, definitely, definitely, and that's not even because he's, I roll with him. He's just like, he's inspired me a lot, we learn from each other, a lot. It's like, we feed off the back of each other, crazy. You got like the girl you heard on um, my track, um, Baby Blue. You got Bruiser, who, you know what, like, Bruiser's that the ultimate British hooligan. He raps like this, and you know, he's like, you know, give me something, let's have it. Like, he's, he's really crazy. You know, you hear Bruiser in the studio, he's banging his head all over the place. You know, like, Bruiser's crazy. Like, I don't know if I've got anything of Bruiser. No, I ain't got nothing of Bruiser. I ain't got nothing of Bruiser. Um, who else is there? Obviously, the streets, respect the streets a lot. Basement Jacks a lot. Bigs? Uh, Bigs, yeah. Bigs is crazy. I was going to get to Bigs. Uh, don't tell him I didn't say him. 
<laughs> Biggs, um, Wiley, Diz, who else is there? Who else is coming through? A couple of people. There's a lot of a lot of artists coming through, but it takes a lot of tracks for me to, you know, mm. put you in my list. It takes a lot of versatility, mm. you know, and a can you do it again kind of thing. And what about just music people, not necessarily MCs or vocalists, but just music. Music in general. From, from any style. Um, what? Current new, music. New, old, or, whatever. New, old, pff, a lot of different people, man. I won't lie, my favourite artist of all time, and this ain't ever going to change, is Michael Jackson. Like, I don't care what anybody says, like, if he done it, I don't know if he done it or not. You know, people should keep their children away from him. Understand? Like, you know, if you don't want Michael to touch your children, tell him to stop leaping on him. Like, you know, like, he's got Neverland. So obviously children are going to go there. Like, just don't let your kids go there and there won't be no problem. You hear me? I don't, like, I won't lie. I don't, I don't know if he done it or not. I want to believe he didn't do it, because I like him a lot. I like his music a whole lot. But Michael, Prince, you know what I mean, like, Coldplay, um, who else is really doing it for me? A lot of different people have influenced me, man. Yeah. It's a bit hard to say, because Ludacris. I like Ludacris a lot. I think he's one of the most underrated. Even though he's really successful, I feel like on a credi credibility level, people don't rate him as much. People believe he's just a club, you know? 50 Cent is actually a really good rapper. You know, he's really good at conveying his messages and getting things across. You know, he's managed to, he's got his formula on lock. You know, so most of the successful people are actually the best at what they do. You know, a lot of people like their crap, but they've dumbed down their formula. You know, when you hear a lot of these successful rappers in their raw days, they were really raw. And then they, they dumbed it down for commercial appeal. So, would you, know. you do that? Huh? Would you do that? Clarity wise, not dumbed down, but sometimes I use language that is universal to others. Mm. You know, there's some things that I don't say in my everyday speech that I might say in a lyric because I want people to understand it. If you want to sell records and you want to make money through doing music, you've got to meet the consumer halfway. You have to, it's just a fact. You know, you've got to meet the consumer what halfway. Point, what, what point does that become, you compromising the art side? Not just the language you're using the to art. communicate, but you, well, you're just talking about the creative stuff and you're saying yeah. that, you know, when you're in the label, you don't want to take the deal because you want it on your terms and you want to be able to do uh -huh. it without compromise. But w if you have to meet the consumer halfway and the consumer ain't really what you're about, then wh wh where do you draw that line? Excuse me, consumer's not what I'm about. No, I mean, if, you, if, you, if you've got to meet the consumer halfway and the consumer is not necessarily into the pure sway, yeah. you know, where do you draw that line of, of compromise artistically? Wherever you feel comfortable. You know, if you're doing something that you're not comfortable with, that's the line drawn already. That's, mm -hmm. that's where you've crossed the line. You know, how far, like, girls can be also known as gash in London. I could say, you know, I phone, I, the other day I phoned my gash, but it wouldn't work well in Germany or, you know, Switzerland. People are going to be, what is a gash? People are going to be like, what the hell is he talking about? He phoned his gash, what is that? You know, so my compromise for that would be, the other day I phoned my girl. It's that simple, you know? It's not like, all right, I'm gonna do something totally different I don't understand. That's my idea of compromising, you know? So, it's nothing deep. It's nothing that I'm ashamed of or nothing that I hide, you know? It's just make the job easier. I wanna be successful. I do wanna sell records, of course. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to move their parents and all of that, you know? Like, I wanna do a lot of stuff, so. Any more for any more? No? You talking about women from uh, the UK, and um, I was thinking about growing up, it was kind of a head trip uh, to find out like Moni Love, who's down with the native tongues, um, especially on the uh, ladies' first track with Queen Latifah, mm -hmm. and then she started breaking down the whole London kind of, kind of you know, rapping, you know, more of that kind of slang real quick. And I was just like wondering how you guys perceived her being that when she came over, especially in all her hits with the Moni in the middle and all that stuff, she completely was rapping straight like American, you mm, know? Mm. But how did you all perceive that? And then my second, my follow-up question is um, going from Moni to more current person. Um, I've been hearing a lot about the Lady Sovereign chick with the grime scene and stuff, and I just wanted your um, thoughts on her as well. Mm. All right, um, first of all, Moni Love. Now, like, I grew up on Moni Love, innit? I love Moni Love. You get me? She's got a lot of, she's given a lot of stuff, but 
she wasn't different to the American movement that was going on at the time. We didn't see her as a UK artist representing for us in America. We just saw her as part of the American movement. Same way we saw Slick Rick. You know, it wasn't a representative, but like, because she had the American twang. Speaking, yeah, she was born in the UK, but you know, it, it, didn't, it didn't matter like that to us. You know, we got a lot of love for her, but she doesn't stand out from Queen Latifah to us. You know, the same way Queen Latifah represents music for me is the same way Moni Love represents music. I don't see them as anything different. The whole Lady Sovereign um, thing is, Lady Sovereign's cool, she's all right. You know, in the, um, in the scene that I come from, in the beginning, a lot of people weren't taking her seriously. You know, she just does her thing. It's like another person doing her thing, another person on Channel U slash MTV base. You know, but I've been hearing a lot of stuff recently, not musically, but hype-wise, like Jay-Z signed her to um, Def Jam in America, and all of, that, all of that hype, it goes through and people are listening, but, you know, I don't know how well she'll do musically. You know, I, me personally, I think she's talented, but I, don't, I haven't heard enough of her to make a proper judgment of whether I like her or not. You know, so yeah, like, you have to remember, when something is as raw as grime, the, the, mess, the, the representatives you get from that scene might not be the real, true representation of that scene. Because the people from that scene, the grime, it is what it is. They don't even have money to come out of their house half of the times. You understand? Let alone go to America and start doing shows. You know, so some of the big, big names are people you wouldn't have heard of. Yeah, Lady Gr Sovereign, Kate, like, came out of the grime scene and everything, but she's not the one of the major players within that scene, not at all.